Today's episode of Parenting Great Kids is brought to you by BetterHelp. With BetterHelp, there's no explaining why you have to leave work, no fighting traffic, and no uncomfortable waiting rooms. BetterHelp lets you connect with an experienced professional therapist in a safe and private environment. Text your therapist anytime, plus schedule phone, video, or chat sessions when it's convenient. And get help at your own time and place. To learn more or sign up, go to betterhelp.com slash Meg. Enter the invite code Meg to get your first seven days free and show your support for the show. There is no shame in getting help because you are worth it. And by March of Dimes. From prematurity to maternal death, the health issues facing families in this country are getting worse. March of Dimes is leading the fight for the health of all moms and babies. We won't stop looking for solutions to improve the lives of families through research, advocacy, and education. Join us at www.marchofdimes.org slash Meg. That's www.marchofdimes.org. Dot org slash Meg. For 30 plus years, I've seen every type of child grow up. Instead of giving me what I wanted, she gave me what I needed, which was truth. Don't let emotions win. Let truth win. Do your very best, and you should have a lot of fun while you do it. And the better you get at something, the more fun you're going to have at something. You moms and dads are wired with everything you need to be a parent to a great kid. Welcome to Parenting Great Kids. This is episode number 51. I'm your host, Dr. Meg Meeker. Friends, I apologize. I'm getting over a cold and my voice is kind of raspy today, so bear with me. Today, we'll be talking about why parents, particularly mothers, need to show respect to sons. I have a great show today with a good friend of mine, Dr. Emerson Egrich. Dr. Egrich is a speaker and a very popular author. He has a runaway bestseller called Love and Respect, but today we're going to be talking with him about his book, Mothers and Sons, The Respect Effect. I know you're going to love it. Also in this episode, I'll be featuring a listener question about a transgender classmate and a mother with postpartum depression. As always, I'll share my points to ponder for you to start using right away. And parents, as a reminder, don't just download the episodes, click subscribe. When you do that, you're joining my parenting revolution and every new episode will automatically show up in your subscribed list. You won't regret it, I promise. We'd love for you to write us a review on iTunes and let us know what you think. Also, Not only are we on iTunes, but the Parenting Great Kids podcast is also now available in the Google Play Store and on Stitcher. So no matter where you get your podcasts, subscribe today. Don't miss one single episode. So friends, I'm also excited to announce that my new course on discipline, Discipline with Courage and Kindness, is available at megmeekermd.com. I am so excited. It took nine months to write. I discuss the four principles of great discipline, whether your child is 2, 10, or 17. So now, my points to ponder. One, show your son respect through your speech. You know, friends, you will be amazed how much better your relationship with your son will be when you speak respectfully to him. This doesn't mean being syrupy sweet or patronizing, but say things like, I love the way you think, or I hear what you're saying, and while I may disagree with you, I really respect what you have to say, so thank you for telling me that. And if you have a teenage son, mothers in particular, begin to use the word man in your speech. Say things like, you are turning into such a kind patient, or disciplined man, and I love watching that. If your son is 16 or 17 or 18 in particular, call him a man. Get rid of cutesy nicknames, no matter how much you love them and how much you want to maintain that relationship that you had with him when he was 6 or 10 or 11. 
But get rid of those nicknames for the time being, because these will make you, him think like you still see him as a boy. And he doesn't want you to think of him as a boy, particularly with moms. One of the best exercises you can do in order to make changes is to take inventory of how you're currently talking to your son. So for the next week, listen to what you say. What tone of voice are you using? Are you talking down to him? Are you talking in a sort of a cutesy baby talk way? Or are you using those cute little names, nicknames that you always did when he was six or or eight? Again, pay attention to whether you talk to him in a respectful tone or do you talk to him as a boy who just doesn't want to grow up and particularly mothers. Pay attention to how you talk to your sons. Are you talking to him in a tone that implies he needs you a lot? And I know that many times we subconsciously do this, mothers. We talk to our sons as though they need our help and they want our help. And try to get rid of that if you can, because it's fostering a childlike relationship and it's making your son feel that you don't respect him. One of the most powerful lessons a parent can learn is this. Begin to treat your son as though he is strong or courageous or kind or independent. You know, a really powerful parenting tool is to begin to treat your child, this goes for sons and daughters, as though he or she is the person that you want them to be. You know, many times we get very frustrated because we, our kids don't want to do something or they whine or they complain or they're not independent enough. But if you begin to treat your child as though he or she is the person you want him or her to be, guess what will happen? That child will begin to act like the child you think he is. So if you want your son to work harder or be more independent or be more patient or be more courageous or be kinder, begin to treat him as though he is independent or courageous or more self-reliant or more patient or kinder and watch what happens. He will step into that role. Then this goes for girls as well. Begin to treat your son as though he is the person you want him to be, not the person that you think he is today. Point to ponder number two. Begin to treat your son as though he is capable, not needy. Often mothers, and I include myself in this, ladies, want to feel needed by our kids. We do this when they're little and we get by with it because our kids do need us. And this is fine when our when our kids are very young, but it can cripple children when they mature into teens and young adults. Sons in particular need to feel independent. They need to feel that as they mature, they're capable of making decisions and controlling certain behaviors. In fact, one of the principles I write about in my new course on discipline, teaching self-control is the real goal of discipline. Think about it. When a son learns that he has self-control, he feels powerful in a very good way. He feels as though he can do certain things. He can get his homework done. He can be better on the soccer field or the football field or playing the violin. It's important that we communicate to our children when they're young adults that there are areas where he no longer needs our help. So point these times out to him. Say things like, If he comes to you asking help on his homework, for instance, say, you know what, son, I know that algebra is tough, or I know that English is hard for you, but you can do this. You don't need my help. So when he asks for help with a particularly hard task, give him a little bit of pushback. Tell him that he he can figure it out on his own. Look for opportunities to encourage your son to do things on his own and have him struggle a bit with it because I guarantee you when he struggles and succeeds, he'll feel a whole lot better about himself than if you helped him along the way. You can say things like, I'm always here to back you up, son, but you don't need me here. Here's a great caveat as well. When your son is an adult and learns that he no longer needs his mother in a childlike way, 
He grows closer to you as he matures. If you allow your son to become independent and give you some pushback, moms, during those teen years, they do this less with dads. They do it, have to do it more so with moms. If you allow him some pushback and allow him to distance himself emotionally from you a bit when he's a teenager, he will come back to you when he's an adult and he will feel closer to you and you'll have a much stronger relationship when he's grown up. Point to ponder number three. Let go. One of the toughest things for a mother of a son to endure is the teen years. And this this isn't because a son acts out, but it's because she sees him as emotionally distancing himself from her. And sometimes this happens overnight. Other times it happens over months and maybe even a couple of years. But you may find that one morning your son wakes up and suddenly he is rude or disengaged to you, mom, but to nobody else. And this can be very painful, but it's an important part of his maturing. Bruno Bettelheim used to say that during adolescence, a teen boy, quote, kills off his mother. He's referring, of course, not to a literal killing, but to an emotional restructuring of his relationship with his mother. Your son may say things to you like, quit asking me so many questions, mom or suddenly give you a short one-word answer to your question. And here's what's happening inside of him. He's subconsciously realizing that he can't be a real man and also rely on his mom for help. He, he, He wants to depend on his mother and he wants to love his mother and he wants to feel needy, but he feels that as a man, he can't do that any longer. So he pushes his mother away for a time to figure it all out. So moms, it has nothing to do with you and everything to do with what's going on inside of him. Since he desperately wants to grow into a man, he puts his mother off as a way of just figuring this all out because he wants to become more independent and feel more manly. So moms, you have to give him space to do that. It is critical for us mothers to honor the process in our sons, to honor this process in our sons and not chase after them or act needy. Like, why are you being so rude? Or why don't you like me anymore? Don't you need my helper? You used to love me when you were a child and now you can't stand me or now you hate me. Don't do that to your sons. We're acting needy when we do that. So stop. I promise you, if you give your son permission to not need you when he's in his teen years, When he is in his 20s, he will come back to you and you will have an even better, stronger relationship than you ever had when he was a child. I promise you. Parents, we all know that talking with our kids about sex is uncomfortable. And when it comes to having that initial talk with your child about sex when they're about eight years old, I always say in every couple, there's one who's a chicken and one who's an even bigger chicken who just won't have the talk at all. But the truth is, no matter how uncomfortable it is, beginning a conversation about sex early with your child is extremely important because it puts you in the driver's seat. The tricky part is many parents often don't know where to begin or where to end? What if they say the wrong thing? What if they talk too much or too little or use the wrong words? Too often not knowing how or when they should approach the topic of sex with their child, many parents just don't do it. And then this leaves your child at the hands of the culture or his friends to teach him about sex. I have created a digital toolkit just for you called How to Have the Talk with your child. It walks you through the process of having that initial conversation with your child about sex. The toolkit's packed with a variety of resources and all the information you need to get ready to have that initial conversation, including ages and stages chart to help you determine when to have the talk with your child. There's an ebook on talking to your child about sex, a script to help guide you through the discussion. And for those of you who are really, really chicken, you're the big chicken, it even includes a video of me giving the talk directly to your child. How easy is that? Talking to your child about sex doesn't need to be intimidating or scary. It can be really a great experience and it'll help you establish a strong relationship with your child. I'm excited to offer you how to have the talk with your child toolkit 
for 20 to 0% off. Just go to my website, megmeekermd.com, click on Parenting Resources, and use your code TALKPODCAST when you check out. Parents, this topic about sex is far too important to hand over to somebody else to talk to your kids about. You need to do it. Go to my website, check out how to have the talk with your child toolkit, 20% off. You need to stay in the driver's seat when it comes to talking to your kids about sex, and I'm here to help. So parents, thanks for listening. This is episode number 51. Stay with us. So now, I would like you to listen in on a conversation I had with Dr. Emerson Egrich. I know you're going to love it. Well, hello, everyone. This is Dr. Meg Meeker, and I'm so excited today to have a good friend, colleague, and a very wise man with me today. His name is Dr. Emerson Egrich. He has a Ph.D. in child and family psychology, a B.A. in biblical studies, and an M.A. in communication, and he is an internationally known public speaker on the topic of male-female relationships. You all may know him as the author of the New York Times bestseller, Love and Respect, and as the president of Love and Respect Ministries, and you'll be happy to hear he has a brand new book called Mother and Son. The Respect Effect. Oh, I love that title. This book speaks directly to mothers of sons out there and is full of practical insight on creating a strong and healthy relationship with your boys. And I'm so excited to talk about it. Emerson, thanks so much for joining me. Oh, Meg, thank you for having me. And uh, I could not be interviewed by a person who is more committed to this topic than you. Well, thank you. Well, you know, I think that we are, and you are, you're a dad and a pastor first before you're an author, and I'm the same way. I'm a mom and a grandma first, and I have a son. So, you know, it really hits close to home here, but I just feel so strongly about this whole idea of helping mothers, because there's so many single moms out there, have great relationships with their sons, but also to champion the masculine in them and really launch them as solid young men in life. And that's a very hard thing for a lot of single mothers to do because they don't always have the guidance of their uh, their spouse or a partner to help them, you know, sort of lead a young man. Before we get into your mother's son book, I'd like to just touch down on love and respect and this whole idea that you write about that women want love and men want respect. How did you come up with that? Where did you find that? Well, both from Scripture as well as from research. The Scripture says in Ephesians 5.33, it's the summary statement to the greatest treatise on marriage in the Bible, most would conclude, a husband must love his wife and a, res- and a wife must respect her husband. But there's been no debate, as you know, uh, on loving uh, a wife. But the respect idea yes. is, is controversial because women don't feel respect. They don't want to be a hypocrite. They don't see him as superior. They're not inferior. Uh, they don't want to return to patriarchy and fear male dominance. They're not going to give him license to do what he wants to do. They're not going to subject themselves to emotional abuse. But other than these things, they're really open <laughs> to hearing what we have to say about the topic. And so you have this pushback. But what we have discovered from Scripture as well as from research, that men actually serve and die for honor. Uh, They're not as narcissistic as some would like to profile them as being. In fact, they actually soften on the heels of what we call respect talk, uh, especially when they don't deserve it. Uh, They will move toward the wife rather than away from her, and there is a, a deeper sense of connection. Now, it's not a formula, but it's a principle that over the lifetime of a marriage, it just works in the same way that a husband might get his wife to shut up if he's harsh and screams at her with anger, and he could pragmatically conclude it does work, but we all know that just closes off the spirit of the, the wife. And so, too, contempt, when you, when you communicate disdain for a man failing to be as loving as he ought to be, uh, he won't feel fond feelings of love and affection in his heart. He'll withdraw. So it really raises the question, how can a wife communicate respectfully in a way that doesn't cause her to feel like she's losing power or a sense of herself, and could it, in fact, really motivate her? And so we've been all about that message for the last 15 years of empowering women. My wife, Sarah, and I do these conferences, and this has been just kind of revolutionary because it's so counterintuitive and countercultural, but when it's applied... It really does produce the very thing that the wife is wanting to do and accomplish on the heels of her disrespect. So what you teach is that a wife or a woman 
can respect a man and show respect to a man without feeling disrespected or inferior in return. Oh, absolutely. I mean, how do we get to a point where we thought that disrespect is going to empower us? It can keep the other person quiet for a period of time, just like harshness and anger toward a woman can. But long term, you lose their heart. We believe that you don't respect bad behavior. This is not saying, oh, I respect the fact that you're committing adultery with our neighbor. That's asinine. Mm-hmm. What we're talking about is respectfully confronting the misbehavior in the same way that a husband lovingly confronts things about his wife. A, a wife who knows her husband is communicating lovingly and wants to do the loving thing, she will soften at some point unless she's just a Jezebel. And so, too, every good-willed man will soften on the heels of a communication that's respectfully delivered. But what happens when she's upset, there's this default mechanism within the female that reacts in disrespectful ways. And the research has pointed out her face turns sour, uh, her eyes you know, darken, the hand on the hip, the scolding finger, the sigh, the rolling the eyes, the head going back. And when estrogen kicks in, it, the, the proclivity to speak with disrespect is natural. It just mm-hmm. comes out. And I think that's why God commands the wife to put on respect because it's extremely natural for her to be disrespectful when she feels unloved. In the same way I say to men, it's very natural for them to be unloving when they feel disrespected. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons this is important is that most women love to love. So men during conflict are not doubting the woman loves him. He doesn't think she likes him. He thinks she's using this topic as an opportunity to send in a message that she finds him despicable. And if a man feels despicable, and we communicate that through our body language or voice or a tone of voice, then he just retreats? Is that what you're saying? Or does he get angry back? What does he do? Both of those. But the University of Washington studied 2,000 couples for 20 years in their laboratory setting, and they said 85% of those who stonewall in withdrawal is the male, and he will just shut down, typically. The good-willed man may have momentaries of, you know, he'll give you the look of anger, but most of them will just disengage. He'll drop it. He'll just distance himself and say this is not... And partly he does that because in the man's world, we live by the honor code, and when two best buddies get fuming mad at each other, we separate because we don't want this thing to escalate to the point where it becomes lethal. So we actually are doing an act of honor here, but in the woman's world, when we do that, it feels like an act of hostility. Mm -hmm. Or weakness. Well, yeah, well, she, yeah. She, she feels unloved. She can't, yeah, exactly. She could not imagine, as the researchers found out, uh, deflating and withdrawing over what she would see as such a minor criticism. So how could he be so childish? How could he be so immature? I, I don't usually say she sees him as weak, but maybe. But moral, I can't believe this immature reaction. Or what women will say is, if he really loved me, he wouldn't walk out of the room. That's right. That's why they see it as an act of hostility, which yes. is the opposite of love. And he hates me. Why would he do this? How can you, you say this? And even women who say, well, I want R-E-S-P-E-C-T, we say, absolutely, everybody needs respect. We're not talking about the true need here. We're talking about the felt need during conflict. But even there, when you continue to show disrespect to a woman week after week, she'll say, how can you say you love me and show me this disrespect? Whereas the man, you show him disrespect week after week, and he'll say, I don't deserve this disrespect. Everybody respects me but you. Why doesn't he land on love? Because women love to love. Within their nature, they nurture. And only when a, until a woman says to her husband, I no longer love you uh, because I'm having an affair or you so wounded me, I'm leaving, most men are assured of a woman's love. So you say to Joe, does your wife love you? Oh, yeah. Does she like you? <laughs> no, not today. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Let's press into this, you know, the love and respect a little bit deeper why do you feel that so many men feel disrespected in our, in our culture today outside of their families? And Because we're going to be talking about sons in a little bit. But I think beyond what women communicate to their husband, our world is communicating some very powerful things to, to men, too, isn't it? Well, yeah, and I think that's an excellent question. And I think somehow, because I think of feminism, with all the goodness in that, and, and people are not mean-spirited. People are, you know, good-willed. But, you know, we all have our frame of reference. We all have our presuppositions. And I think many have tried to figure out the male behavior. For instance, the withdrawing, they don't see that as an act of honor. They see it as unloving, as hateful, as hostile. So there's a profiling of the male's behavior through the feminine grid. And when you do that, you end up having very negative feelings about the man. I was interviewed by a syndicated radio program and said, oh, we wish you were here last week. We had a, a series on silence abuse. 
<laughs> you know, there's oh, emotional abuse, yes. there's verbal abuse, physical. Now it's silent abuse. And I said, let me see if I get that straight. During conflict, the husband shuts down and doesn't speak, and that's now viewed as abusive. Exactly. Exactly. That. We wish you were here last week. And then I explained what I just said to you. Could this actually be an act of honor? Because the researchers pointed out when a man is in conflict, his heart beats get to 99 beats per minute. He looks mm-hmm. stoic. He looks calm. And she looks like she's out of control, but her heart beats, BPMs, are normal. Yes. And so what he's got to do is calm down because that's the honorable thing to do. That's mm-hmm. not abusive just because she feels unloved at that moment. One of the points I make is that we've got to come to a point where we realize we're not wrong. We're just different. Pink's not yes. wrong for not being blue. Blue's not wrong for, for not being pink. But somehow we have in this culture that because we're, we're equal, therefore we must be the same. And because I as a woman feel normal and I feel that my position is right, then he's got to be abnormal and he's got to be wrong. Yeah. And once we come to that point, we begin to judge the other person very severely. Instead of saying we're both right, we're just different. Unless yes. there's an intrinsic evil. But most conflicts are over preferences. So neither one of us are wrong. We're just different. Right. And there's a huge amount of misunderstanding and miscommunication there. And it's really the understanding and then the communication that helps you understand a different perspective and then you can relate differently. What do you say to women or men, for that matter, who have a spouse that is really behaving badly? You have a wife whose husband is an alcoholic and she hates his behavior how do you coach her to be respectful of the man but hate his behavior? That's a really uh, thin, tight rope that some women walk, I think. Well, yeah, and we're not urging a robotic response. We're not pieces of machinery that have no feelings, but we're talking about the, the pattern here. That, uh, But when you talk about adultery, when you talk about addiction, when you talk about abuse, when you talk about abandonment, the four A's I call them, you, you're, you're dealing with a severe situation. And in each of those, you have to then deal with what I call streetwise individuals. You know, if you're going to deal with an addictive behavior, you've got to turn for insight from people who have been dealing with alcoholics for three decades to get their wisdom. But they would all tell you that ultimately you cannot show contempt toward the spirit of the person, particularly the believer. That individual who's addicted is creating the image of God. Just as a woman who is anorexic or has bulimia, you don't show hostility toward her spirit, but you don't like for one moment the fact that she has these eating disorders because Mm -hmm. it's killing her. Mm -hmm. So, too, the addiction is is an evil thing. But is your husband the enemy or the victim of the enemy? And how are you going to proceed with this, you know, policemen when they arrest somebody don't pound on the hood of the car and scream and lose it. You know, yeah. you can respectfully yeah. pull the person over and confront them on the fact that they were speeding. But we haven't coached women or men enough on this, and I think we lose confidence that we can really do this because the pain is so deep that we kind of think, you know, the only thing I can do is go off. And the point, though, is that that won't prove beneficial long term. So it really raises the question, how do we maintain this loving and respectful demeanor in the face of things that are not loving or respectable? Parents, I hope you're enjoying my conversation with Emerson Egrich. We need to take a quick break, but don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with more of my conversation with Dr. Emerson Egrich. Friends, are you getting ready to tackle your spring cleaning? This year, use Mr. Clean Magic Eraser to take on the impossible stains sprays and wipes can't. I tried it on my tough messes and it blew me away. I love it and I use it in my bathroom to get rid of all that soapy scum that builds up on your bathtub that's hard to get off with chemicals and rough pads. And I particularly love it because there's no offensive smells. All you have to do is wet it under the tap, give it a squeeze and it's ready to use. And because it cleans with water alone, you don't have to worry about harsh cleaning fumes or scents. If you're about to take on your spring cleaning, you should definitely try Mr. Clean Magic Eraser. It makes cleaning your toughest kitchen and bathroom messes fast and easy. Check out MrClean.com slash Parenting Great Kids to see more ways the Magic Eraser can help you knock out impossible messes around the house. When it comes to bra shopping, it's all about finding the right fit for you. And there's only one lingerie brand that offers bras in sizes AA through G. Third Love. 
Third Love uses thousands of real women's measurements and super smoothing memory foam to create bras that fit and feel great. While most old school bra brands only carry 15 sizes, Third Love offers 60 sizes, including half cups, which no one else does. Third Love knows there's a perfect bra for everyone. So right now they're offering my listeners 15% off your first order. To find the bra you've been waiting for, all you have to do is answer a few simple questions from Third Love's Fit Finder Quiz. It only takes 60 seconds and you can do it all from home. Never have an awkward fitting room experience again. Try a Third Love bra. It's so comfortable, you might forget you're wearing it. And if you don't agree, the turns and exchanges are easy and free. This year, make the change that will change the way you think about bras. Go to thirdlove.com slash Meg now to find your perfect fitting bra and get 15% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash Meg. Thirdlove.com slash Meg. I'm curious, you who were asked by a, a radio host about the whole idea of abuse by silence, that when a husband goes silent, he's actually abusing you. And you said, no, 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 you're misunderstanding. This is a, a code of honor. This is what he does to be honorable, to contain his rage. When you said that, what did the host say back? Did she understand? Well, yeah, once you understand what the research is pointing out, and it's not even necessarily containing the rage as much as not wanting to escalate this conflict into a, a, a fight that he deems is unnecessary, and because his heartbeats are 99 beats per minute, he needs 15 minutes to calm down. We're talking about good-willed men. We're not talking about the man who uh, goes silent for 15 days, and if she says anything, he throws her out the window. Right. Well, sometimes we create these anomalies, and then we work back from that and validate the principles overall. So my campaign has been among people of goodwill. If you're married to a spouse that doesn't have good will, they have ill will, evil will, you've married Hitler's distant cousin, then you're dealing with a Judas-type individual. And there are rage issues. My dad had rage. My mom separated for six years. So that's one scenario. But overall, we're talking to people whose husband, whose wife is good-willed. They, you know, they don't perform perfectly. But when that man goes silent, it's not because he's trying to be abusive. He's trying to calm himself down because his heartbeats are 99 beats per minute. And you have to decode. You have to reframe things. Otherwise, we end up passing judgment on that person as having serious problems. And when we talk about respecting the spirit of the man, we're talking about communicating your need respectfully, saying something, I don't want to come across disrespectful. I'm not trying to dish you right now. I'm not using this topic as another opportunity to send you a message that I despise you. How do I convey my hurt and my frustration? How do I tell you I need your strength without you walking away from me? Now, if she frames it that way, most men calm down quicker and will stay engaged. And so we coach women on how to do that, which also applies to how a mother can confront her boy. Mm, that's wonderful. You know, I'm feeling guilty as you're talking. I'm seeing my husband shaking his head, walking out of the room over and over and over because he gets so frustrated with me at times. And I, I think I need some coaching. Let's talk about your mother-son book, Mother and Son, The Respect Effect. So is the same respect that a grown man needs similar to the respect that a young boy would need from his mom? Yes. I mean, would the same question make sense to you if I said, does the girl's need for love kind of follow along the wife's need for her husband's love? So should daddy love her daughter in ways that might be very similar to the way that he shows love to his wife? And the answer is unequivocally yes. And the, the man is in the boy. And uh, that boy will begin to manifest from age four on these little male characteristics. And how do you then speak into that when he's absolutely driving you nuts? You know, you talk about respect talk. And mothers, what is respect talk? Well, and it's, that's the heart of the book. And it's, it, as you heard me talk just briefly there a moment ago about using what we call respect vocabulary. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I'm not trying to dishonor you. I need your strength right now. I'm feeling vulnerable on the heels of what you've just done, that I don't respect what you've done here, but I know it doesn't reflect the deeper man that I believe in. Now explain mm. to me what's going on here. That kind of language 
is what l- male leaders do toward other men. We instinctively do that, just as women are always affirming other women. You look beautiful. You, you go, girl. You, they understand the inferiority feelings that women have, the lack of confidence at moments. They instinctively know. That's why a, a mother will coach her uh, husband when the daughter comes down with a new dress. Now, tell her she looks lovely. Tell her she looks lovely. Yeah. And there is this coaching of fathers, but we haven't coached mothers with mm-hmm. regard to respect talk. And I just encourage them to use some different vocabulary words, and it's just mind-boggling what happens. You know, you're really hitting on something extremely important here, but very, very difficult for mothers. Because we know that mothers of boys, say, under age 10, want to feel connected. They want to feel close. They want to feel there's a bond that a mother and a young son has that changes over time. It's supposed to change over time. How do you coach a mother to use respect talk to a little boy without feeling that she's losing that closeness she feels with him? Maybe I'm saying something bigger than I'm, than I'm really meaning, but I'm not getting down to the heart of it. But how do you help a mother talk respectfully or use a respect talk to a little boy well it's it's huge it's a we 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 hit all of the ages and stages in the book and but here's here's something that's interesting um you will find mothers well first of all the book consists of all of these uh emails i've received from women who went to our love and respect conference and they said you know this applies to my husband but you know what this applies to my precious baby boy and there was Mm -hmm. this excitement and make, they started writing me. I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds in this book deals with these testimonies. But, for instance, here's a, a mother of a five-year-old boy. One night while putting my sons to bed, my five-year-old, in the midst of my monologue about how much I loved him, looked at me sadly and said, Mom, are, are you proud of me? Uh. Shocked, I expressed immediately that I was, of course, proud of him. He asked forlornly, then why don't you ever tell me so? Then she said this, ever since then, I have worked to hold back on my desire to grab him up off the floor and smother his cheeks with kisses, and instead I practice putting one hand on his shoulder and telling him I'm proud of him. He responds to that simple gesture by puffing out his chest and replying, Mm -hmm. thanks, Mom, with a nod of his head, and he walks away feeling more valued than if I'd kissed his cheek for a year. Yeah. Now, Meg, we receive countless emails like this, and not only on the young boys is this happening, but you can see it with the olders as well. But here's, here's a, a mother who writes, we have four children, two boys and two girls. Our boys are in the middle and 16, or, are in the middle and 16 months apart. Our boys were arguing, I think they're 11 and 13, were arguing and bickering and annoying each other on purpose. <laughs> at eight, oh, that, yeah, there she says, at age 9 and 10. And she said, I would remind them to be nice, right? I would remind them to show kindness. Mm -hmm. And their actions would change for the moment, but it didn't reach their hearts. Then she says, as I applied the respect principle of them and said such things as, you aren't showing your brother respect when you do X, Y, Z. Or you show your friends respect, so you need to extend that same respect to your brother. And then she says this, it was life-changing. It spoke to their hearts. Mm -hmm. Now, don't get me wrong, she said. They still have disagreements at 13 and 14. But they are quick to resolve them, and they are best of friends. Wow. And it's this kind of testimony. In fact, my relationship with my 22-year-old son improved overnight. Who knew that simple changes in words could make such a difference? Now I tell him how much I appreciate him, and he tears up. Before, I told him I loved him and got back, I know, I know, I love you too. Learning the right words to get my feelings across in a way they can be assimilated was so easy. And Mm -hmm. I I love that thing, easy. Women are very capable at words, at the use of words. And so this is not really that tough to do. And we're only talking about several vocabulary words. And mothers love words. They love to communicate. And as this lady said, when she started doing it, it was easy. And the response was incredible. You know, I know exactly what the mother's talking about. I think that women love to lavish affection and kisses and hugs 
onto our sons. We want to show them understanding. We want to teach them about their feelings and their emotions. And, you know, a lot of times they don't respond very well to that. But I think that in this, there's something that we need to address as well. And that is mothers want to be needed by their sons. And and mothers want to do things for their sons. And we don't want to push them away and say, you can do this on their own. We want to do it for them. And I think that many times mothers feel they're being very loving to their sons by protecting them, by talking to their teachers, by talking to the coaches, by doing things for their sons. But I think that many times we cripple them by our need to feel needed by them. Well, that was well said. I mean, I think that's exactly right. And and I... I take the position that, you know, you're going to be a mother. You're going to love. God designed women to love. He doesn't command any wife, for instance, to agape love her husband. Nothing in the married passages deal with a woman loving her husband. It's all about respect. So why? Well, God put it within the nature of a woman to nurture, and you're going to hug. So I say you don't stop doing that, even though this mother in this illustration I gave earlier kind of withheld that a little bit, pulled back from that, because she discerned maybe that was the more important thing to do. I say keep being that mom. But go beyond just the love to the respect message. Now, if the mm-hmm. motive is to keep your son somehow, you know, the helicopter mom, and you're going to keep the boy dependent upon you, then you need to sit down with some older women and, and talk that through. But I will tell you that you will lose your boy if you mother him too much. Yeah. The way in which you'll keep him around, and this is why there's some, why, why is it some boys continue to call their mom, continue over the years, continue to engage, some of it's unhealthy, but in the overarching thing, there are mothers who have figured this out. When you honor a boy, he wants to be around that. He will call mom when a mom honors. This is the kind of message that actually will keep the connection. One of the things we point out is all of these emails that we got, women were experiencing a greater connectivity, and connection, as you know, with women is huge, connectivity in the literature, as mm-hmm. well as they notice a lesser negative response from the boy. Now, boys are still going to be independent and irritate us at times. There's, this is not a formula. But when mothers applied this, the connectivity increased, the negativity decreased, relatively speaking, as well as the fact that the very longing of her heart to be needed actually took on a little bit of a different approach, but he began to turn toward her rather than her chasing after him. But she's got to take this by faith, and she's got to see this over a 10-year period. Plus, Jesus said a son is going to leave his father and mother, so you've Mm -hmm. got to be preparing him to leave, not cleave to you. He's got to go toward your, his wife at that point. But that doesn't mean the relationship you have with him will end. This is the key to it continuing. You talk in the book about mothers standing shoulder to shoulder with their sons. What do you mean by that? Yes. Boys are activity oriented. They like to do activities. I mean, some say boys shouldn't go to school until they're 10 because they love doing activities outside and listening to stories. So we bring him inside at five, have him sit down, be still, and listen to concepts. Yeah. Jesus, the master teacher, had 12 men outside doing activities, uh, speaking parables. I think that's replete with significance. And boys love to do things. They like to be active. And so one of the respect effects is your two boys are out playing catch, 11- and 13-year-olds. Just go out there in a lounge chair and sit and watch them for 15 minutes. Don't mm-hmm. say one thing. Just watch them. The problem is, mother said, I don't have time to do that. Now, if the boys want to talk, I'll do that. But if just sitting there watching them play is a waste of time. She says the same thing with her husband. But men need shoulder-to-shoulder time with the females in their life that, who will watch them do that activity, just be there. And you think, well, how in the world would that be helpful? The way it's helpful, when she calls him to dinner and says, go wash your hands and also make your bed that you forgot to do, The energy is positive in those boys, and they're very responsive to mother's instructions. Why? Because the boys felt very energized by her shoulder-to-shoulder time without talking. Mm. That makes no sense to women. But I just say to women, don't argue with me. Just do it for the next six weeks when the occasion presents itself and watch what happens. It is something that is a miracle for many women, Meg. They had no idea if they just sat and watched. And I've had mothers say, my son will say, come, Mommy, come watch me or come be. And so she starts playing with the toys. And she says, no, I don't want you to play with the toys. And she said, I didn't understand what it was until my husband said, he just wants you with him to watch him. Isn't that fascinating? 
I have a friend who's in her 50s, and her husband made a remark to her the other day that he loves it when she stops by his work and just sees him work. And I scratched my head, and I thought, how odd is that? But that's the exact same concept. So do we drown our boys with our words? Oh, Sarah, Sarah my <laughs> wife, addresses this in the book as well as in the, in the parenting book. She had what she called the 20 questions she would ask of our sons. And, and just, you know, again, because that's the way God has wired women. We're not being demeaning toward that. You've got to, that will always be part of who you are. What we're talking about is not stopping that necessarily, but we're talking about adding some other factors here. And that one, would, in this instance, don't ask as many questions. Just drive along with him when you pick him up and go quiet and watch what happens. Now, don't do it with an attitude, you know. Don't do it with a, you know, okay, I'll, you know. No, just be quiet. Just, you don't have to fill in the silence with words. You as a woman feel that way with women, because women give the report to build rapport, that you, you will mm-hmm. talk if there is silence, because that's how you connect with people. That's mm-hmm. the loving thing to do. Boys don't feel unloved if you sit there in silence. They aren't feeling that they're unloving when they sit there in silence. So just enter into that male arena and watch what happens. All male leaders will do this. You don't necessarily start talking right away. You just sit there quietly. Mm -hmm. And then what happens, and Deborah Tannen did this research on dyad. She called it two six-year-old girls, two 12-year-old, two 16, and two 20, and they were best of friends. And the same thing with boys, two six-year-old boys, two two, uh, 12-year-old girls, uh, 16 and 20, uh, boys, that is. And, And she wanted to see what they did, and I won't get into the background, but they recorded who had the most transparent conversations, and it was the two 16-year-old boys who sat in two chairs, looking straight ahead, hardly said anything, and when the one was very transparent with the other, the other didn't even look at him. But the conversation was deep. And the point I make is men will open up and men will share, but they won't do it if they feel that you are going to disrespect them, you're going to dishonor them. They have to have a sense of friendship, and that comes quite often on the heels of doing activities together. And there's a Mm -hmm. sense of camaraderie. And when that confidence is there, they'll start talking. Emerson, your book is so important and the work that you do. How can people get in contact with you? Do you have a website that you'd like to tell us about? In fact, we um, uh, do. Loveandrespect.com, L-O-V-E-A-N-D-R-E-S-P-E-C-T.com. And there we have a podcast my son and I are doing. We have a lot of information on our Facebook. We have about 1.7 million following us on Facebook. We're putting mm-hmm. out mother-son information there. We have a lot of free information. We also have resources and, of course, the Respect Effect, the book, Mother and Son, the Respect Effect, is available in all outlets, uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, you name it, they've got it. And uh, we would love for your listeners to consider taking the time and reading the pages of that book. Oh, absolutely. It's such an important book. Not even just for mothers who have sons, but for any woman who is concerned about boys. And I would encourage fathers to read it as well, because they're in there and they need to encourage their wives to change the way they speak to their sons and approach their sons. So I think it's a hugely important book for everybody. So thank you so much for writing it and for being with us. Thank you. All right, parents, let's get social. I want to hear from you and interact with you. You can connect with me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Meg Meeker MD. Or if you have a question, send it to askmeg at megmeekermd.com. That's askmeg at megmeekermd.com. Today I have a question from Tony who writes, Help! My daughter is in fourth grade and told me that she has a girl in her class who says she's a boy. She wants the teacher and classmates to call her Evan, not Elaine. Her teacher spoke to all the kids and told them to call the girl Evan, and the teacher refers to this child as a boy. My daughter is confused because she says that the child looks, talks, and acts like a girl most of the time. She plays with the girls, not the boys, although she dresses in very masculine clothes. Our daughter is confused and asking a lot of questions about the child, What should we do? Tony, that's a great question. So friends, I want to have a reasonable conversation about the transgender issue that's going on right now. And I know for a lot of parents, this is a highly emotionally charged issue. So I'd like to take it down a level and just talk about it from a medical standpoint, if you will, and have a reasonable conversation. Here are some medical facts about transgender children. 
first, the true prevalence of transgender in children is very, very low. It's less than 0.5% and usually shows itself well before a child starts school. In the 30 years of that I've been practicing pediatrics, I have encountered one true transgender child, and I've worked in some of the busiest children's hospitals in the country. A child who feels that he or she is living inside the body of the opposite sex feels deep psychic conflict and needs real help, and that's a true transgender child. With the increase in the popularization of transgenderism, we have seen a steep rise in the number of kids who say they're transgender. They, quote, come out, if you will, when they're older or if their parent sees a girl acting masculine or a boy acting feminine, the parent may say, perhaps you're transgender. Sadly, many children are wrongly diagnosed, and this is sad for the child who's wrongly diagnosed. That said, Tony, who knows if your daughter's friend really is transgender or is simply jumping on the bandwagon of a popular trend. In other words, in a year or two or three, your daughter's friend may say, I don't want to be called Evan anymore. Please call me Elaine. So here's what I encourage you to say to your daughter, something like this. Honey, sometimes a girl is born and feels like she's living in a boy's body. And there are some girls who know they're girls, but really want to be a boy. So they ask to be called a boy's name. One of these is happening to your friend, and I don't know which is happening. What is important for you is to realize that if you look at your friend and see a girl, you're right in what you see. What you can't see is what's in your friend's heart or mind. I want you to know that this is confusing to you, and sometimes it's confusing to grown-ups too. I would like you to do this, though. Respect her, be kind to her, and never make fun of her. Some kids might do this, but I want you to be kind to her. If she wants to be called Evan, call her Evan. That's okay. And it's okay for you to be kind of confused too. Here's why I want you to say something like that to your daughter, Tony. First of all, as a fourth grader, your daughter is very egocentric. When she looks at a child and sees a girl and a teacher or an adult comes along and says, what you see is not a girl, but a boy, your daughter assumes that the teacher's right and she's wrong. And then your daughter makes another leap in her mind and is this, that she can't adequately assess what she's seeing in the world around her. She sees a girl, and since the teacher says, what you see is not correct, she's really a boy, your daughter assumes that she's wrong, and now she calls into question how well she can size up what's around her And she begins to have some serious, deep-seated self-doubts. And you need to dispel them. That's why you say to her, what you see is a girl and your assessment is accurate. But I want you to call your friend a boy. It is confusing and it's perfectly fine for your daughter to be confused. Parents, I love answering your questions. So please keep sending them in to me. You can email me any question. No question is off limits. Email me your parenting questions to askmeg at megmeekermd.com. Again, that's askmeg at megmeekermd.com. I want to thank my guest and my friend, Dr. Emerson Egrich. Please check out his book, Mothers and Sons, The Respect Effect, and also all of his work and his terrific book, love and respect. You're going to really find it helps in your marriage, whether you have a good marriage or a marriage that's even struggling a little bit. So let's recap my points to ponder. One, show your son respect through your speech. Two, begin to treat your son as though he is capable, not needy. And three, let go. Particularly important lesson for us mothers when we have our teenage sons. 
So until next time, parents, always remember that great kids are raised, not born. Hey, this is Bobby, producer of Meg Meeker's Parenting Great Kids podcast. We hope you've enjoyed listening to Episode 51, Raising Strong Sons. And thanks to you, Dr. Meg's Parenting Revolution has grown to over a million downloads. You can like Dr. Meeker on Facebook and follow her on Twitter and Instagram at Meg Meeker MD. As a reminder, go to MegMeekerMD.com and sign up for her newsletter for giveaway opportunities and updates. And don't forget to share the podcast, write us a review, and click subscribe so you won't miss an episode. 